this is Tony Speaks, and this is my lovely wife, Kim. We are the founders and co-creators of the lifestyle brand and podcast, Becoming Disciplined. Every week we meet, learn from, and share best practices with highly disciplined men and women from a variety of fields and endeavors. Follow us on our journey. Today, Becoming Disciplined is very special to me. Today, I interview a young man who, when I first met him, he had little to nothing. But with God, his wife, and his children anchoring his life, Justin Stanley has become a man of solid character and a successful business owner. He is a faithful husband, a loving father, and the CEO of Gutter Ethics, the leading roofing, gutter, and siding company in Northern Virginia. But today, Justin Stanley is becoming disciplined. Today on Becoming Disciplined, we interview Virginia entrepreneur Justin Stanley. Justin, welcome to Becoming Disciplined. We are so honored to have you. Oh, man, the blessing is mine. If you all knew the relationship I have with this gentleman and, and what he did for me in my life, uh, the, the pleasure is all mine. Oh, thank you, my brother. Thank you. Thank you. But Justin, before you educate us and share your current story, I think it's good for my audience to be aware of your context the beginning of your story. Where did you grow up? Um, keep it short-winded, born in Alexandria, um, arguably Fairfax County Hospital, a couple years in Alexandria, kind of off the GW Parkway. Um, then my parents made the jump to down the Woodbridge when uh, Woodbridge was kind of like the Spotsylvania of the day where that's when, you know, people said, hey, I want to get out of the craziness of Northern Virginia. I want to get to the, you know, you know the, the country. Um, and this was before Potomac Mills Mall. This was before any of that. I remember when there was a little airport on Old Bridge Road. There was a, a freaking airport on Old Bridge Road. Um, small little private one for private planes and stuff. And um, yeah, so that was it. You know, they, they, you know, and when you told somebody you lived in Dale City, they were like, <laughs> you know, where's that at? And, you know, I'm like, yeah, man. And the easiest way they always answered, of course, was over the, the, the 123 bridge, you know, over the Aquaquan bridge. And it was there. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So I grew up there and, um, gotta say, man, childhood was awesome to be honest with you. Now, when you were a child, was there someone who inspired you with their level of discipline? Yeah. A lot of people. And it was all, it was all family members. Um, you know, the 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 cliche scenarios of seeing athletes and and being like wow that's amazing um but it was always family members and 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 different variations of discipline and different aspects of life different levels of that discipline and those different aspects of life and praise be to god i was uh even at a young age witty enough to be able to decipher of like so you do that well you do that well you do that well, and then just paying attention and observing and trying to extract as much as I could. Okay. Now, did you play a lot of sports growing up? Um, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, again, man, I, you know, I feel like I'm kind of, I'm getting old in this statement. You know what I'm saying, Tony, when I say this is that I feel like, um, I might be one of the last generations of where, um, I still refer to us as like Sandlot kids. You know, we were knuckleheads. Um, uh, I never did not, I, I, my dad always made sure we had a fresh basketball hoop in the driveway. You know, there was, there was, um, uh, we had the home plate and every other, you know, uh, third base, this, that, and the other spray painted in the middle of the court. And God bless the lady across the street with her aluminum siding who did not mind us whacking that joint with tennis balls every day of the week. Uh, and if matter of fact, if you hit it over her roof, that was called a grand slam. If you oh. hit it over her fences, it was a home run. Over the roof of her house, grand slam. And, of course, you know, we're hitting with aluminum bats and a tennis ball, so we were just killing them things, just like, you know, knocking them left and right. So we did that, of course, you know, the cliche, like, little sandlot knucklehead kid stuff. And then I played organized sports for sure. My dad was really elite at one time in baseball. He, he could have made it to the Seattle Mariners. He, he literally chose not to for no other reason other than my mom was pregnant with my brother. And he didn't want to jump into that world of being gone and moving and uprooting the family and, you know, did the classic thing of like, all right, I'm going to grind it out, get a job and do what I'm supposed to do. Because, you know, at that time, you know, baseball wasn't what it is over the last 25 years where guys were just guaranteed this, this, this and this. Um, so to get to your question, yeah, I played a ton. 
some organized, a lot of it just classic old school little knuckleheads, you know, getting in the, you know, little, you know, fist fights out in the fields. And, um, but it was a part of my life for sure. Awesome. 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 Now, what advice would you give? We're going to time travel a little bit here. What yeah. advice would you give to your 15 year old self? Oh, oh. <laughs> hey, bro, we can fill we can fill five hours of a podcast <laughs> and then some with that question. Um, but I, I, I'll I'll keep it. Grind it down to a sentence. Grind it down to a sentence. Like if you could whisper one sentence to 15 year old Justin Stanley, what would you tell him? Um, two sentences. Uh, definitive purpose and, and and get rid of the distractions. Um, yeah, get rid. Just realize this world is full of distractions, bro, and they're gonna come at you, and you know. Don't worry about it. Don't pay attention to him. Awesome. Awesome. Now, the spouse that you pick or find is a huge part of success in life. At least it was for me. Um, yes, sir. How did you know that Miss Kendall was the right pick? And in other words, I have two little daughters who will see this mm. interview in 12 years. Hey, man, um, really. What should they look for in a husband and what should they look for in a mate? And how did you make such a good uh, such a good decision? Uh, all glory be to God on that one, man. Um, that was, I mean, you know the backstory, but I'll give a quick one. So my wife, Kendall, her grandfather, Pastor Roberts, my wife's grandfather, who's the head pastor of Christ Chapel. Um, this was a figure in my life that I grew up seeing off and on. And when I say figure, meaning he was, you know, I'd show up for Easter Sunday, I'd see the man, I'd go to maybe like a youth camp every once in a while in the summer. So Christ Chapel at the time in Woodbridge, for those who don't understand geographically, was like kind of like the church in the sense of size and where it was located right next to the mall, right next to Garfield High School. So, you know, for a person that didn't, for a person who grew up in a family that didn't look for their real church, it was the church. That's where you went. Like if you wanted to go to church on Easter Sunday, you went to Christ Chapel. That's what you did. So here I am seeing this man and, 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 you know, and who he is and, you know, at the time. And, um, you know, when he, when he, uh, I mean, to put that in perspective of how much we just saw them as the church, and he, as the pastor was when my grandparents died on my mom's side, both of her parents died, um, without a question, this is before I, I, I didn't even know my wife was alive in this world without a question. My parents were like, Oh, well, that's, who's going to do my my mom's funeral or my dad's funeral. Pastor Roberts, like no questions. And um, quick story I want to share on that real quick. You know, you just never know what you're going to see with God. Um, he, when my grandmother passed away, sadly young, 63 years old, um, her, my grandmother, and my grandfather, again, this is my mom's parents. They were separated, never divorced, separated. It, I remember, and my grandfather was a country boy from Beckley, West Virginia, successful country. And probably about 15 20 homes before he passed away. I mean, he was a grinder. He always used to say, if you know people, if you know money, you'll be fine in life. And so getting back to the influence of family, he was one of them, big time. But if you saw him, he was also a simple man. He was the kind of guy to show up to your house and walk into your uh, refrigerator and open up your ham. And you say, Grandpa, that lunch meat's like a week and a half old. He'd take the top piece off, take the other pieces, wash it in cold water and say, it's good, bro. And then he would just eat it. So he was a simple, simple man. But I remember at the funeral of my grandmother, he made sure there was limos picking everybody up. I mean, we went big and bold. I mean, the amount of money he probably spent was insane. And I remember him walking up and I'm, I am i feel like I was the only one that saw this and God knew I had to see this. He walked up to Pastor Roberts. Again, I have no clue who my wife is. We've never met. He walked up to Pastor, Robert, Pastor Roberts and tried to give him $1,000 in cash for doing the service. Because that's how my grandpa, that was my grandpa's love language. He was a money man. Right. And at the end of the day, that's what he did. He slid, he slid money to people, right. cash in hand kind of guy, um, country boy. And I remember watching it, clear as a bell. Pastor Roberts took the money, put it back in his hand and said, please put it and send it into the form and to the church in the form of a check for our, our, our reach, our reach for reaching out to, you know, other charities and this, that, and the other. And I remember thinking, I was like, man, wow. You know, like, look at that, you know, lo and behold, did I know I was looking at the future great grandfather of my kids talk with the great grandfather of my kids one would never meet his great grandkids because he would pass away before they were born one had no clue he was staring at the man who would help birth 
his wow. great grandkids on me. I'm telling you, bro, the backstory awesome. on that joint is like, it's, you know, it's, it's God's awesome. amazing, man. And fast forward, fast forward, you know, uh, years later when uh, God really started to, uh, I've always said with Jesus, you know, you take one step, he takes 99. And so when I took that one step uh, and he took those, those 99 and it came in thick and heavy, I, I remember just telling him, I said, God, I don't want. I don't want no say in any of this thing called life anymore. I'm just going to let you do what you do. And um, I, I was at church one day, saw Kendall from afar. And I almost felt bad, right? Because I see this attractive young lady. And I'm thinking to myself, like, man, that's not what I'm here for. You know, that's not like, you know, like, uh, you know. But God knows the desires of the heart, right? God knows. I mean, he knows. He, he created us. He, he knows. And um, And so... Brush it off, brush it off, brush it off. And divinely, we just kept crossing each other's paths within the church, like physically crossing each other's paths. And, you know, a little smile, a little smile. And then we saw each other uh, at Smoothie King of uh, Tropical Smoothie, excuse me, Tropical Smoothie in Woodbridge. And um, I was so, so dumbfounded by chatting to her. I still, I t- we tell our kids this story. She had a plate of food. And I walked in, you know, trying to be the gent, trying to be shivery ain't dead. And I said, oh, good to see you finally outside of church. Da, 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 da. I'm like, would you like me to buy you something to eat? And she had a plate of food right in front of me. <laughs> and she looked at me and she looked at me and was like, oh, I'm kind of good. I'm kind of good. I got all of this. And long story short, we saw each other in church again. And we decided to go out on what we refer to as courtship a date. Um, and uh, man, I would love to give you some amazing, wild which I could now because obviously our relationship is molded and grown and we we know each other on levels that only her and I can understand and, you know, other married people can appreciate of their relationship. But at that moment in time, our first evening out together. Again, bro, you, you open up a can of worms here, so I'm trying to keep it clean and crisp for you. <laughs> but on our first evening out together, I knew I'd marry her. That's awesome. Like I knew it. Like I knew it, like there was no, like it, it was like, it was like to the point of, I got in my vehicle, drove her back to her vehicle. She drove away. I pulled into the gas station right next to where her vehicle was. I was so, I guess, just, ex- just exuberant with energy and joy that a bicycle cop, not a motorcycle cop, a bicycle cop pulled up on the gas station and I guess was watching me from afar. And this is where, you know, I can't kind of shake some of that, that wood bridge off of me, I guess, a little bit at the time, at least. And um, he straight up walked up to me and goes, hey, bro, are you are you good? I was like, yeah, man, what's up? He was like, man, you just seem like a little. He's like, man, it's like, you know, it's like 1130 at night, 12 o'clock. And you just seem like, boom, boom, fired up because I was because in my eyes, I just met my wife. And he's like, um, can I search your car? You just seem maybe like you might be intoxicated or something. No lie. Wow. Search the car, search the car, of course, found nothing. And yeah, I mean, that's the joy God can put in your heart to a point where a cop is like, hey, dude, you good? <laughs> <laughs> you good? That's good. That is awesome. You good? And I was, and I, and I, and I, even, I even looked at it. And still, and, still is, and still to this day, I tell, I tell people, whoever, you know, I'm telling the story to, I say, hey, look. I, I was, God can put such a joy in your heart where people can think you're drunk. People can think you're high. Because that's Amen. how I look. That's, that's how I felt, I guess. That's so, in the Bible. That's yeah, in the so Bible. So again, again, long, to, to, get back to, yeah, to get back to the question in short, man, oh, that's why I said right off the bat, you know, I give all glory to God on that because it was just like, I mean, it was spotlight, like, bink, she's the one, Justin. If you do anything else other than this, you have altered the rest of your life. This is it. This is it. This is it. That is awesome. Now, for our audience, you are the father of how many children? Two. Uh, My son, Trust, T-R-U-S-S, who's 10 years old, and my daughter, Sabella, S-A-B-E-L-L-A, who is nine years old. Okay. Well, let's time travel one more time. Yes, sir. We are jumping through the time continuum, and you are now in the uh, delivery room. (laughs) <laughs> and you get to jump into the the no one can see or no one can even see you, but Justin Stanley, eleven mm. years, ten and a half, eleven years ago, mm. to whisper into your ear 
Mm. As a new father, as you're holding your baby for the first time, and you get to whisper a piece of advice to that young father, what 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 do you tell him? Everything you think you know about yourself is is darn near wrong, and you are about to constantly evolve and change. <laughs> and there is <laughs> everything you everything you thought you were today is going to change. And oh, by the way, you're going to learn that the human anatomy can can go on such little rest and energy that you're going to be taken aback by what you're doing for weeks, months on end with three hours of sleep a night, four hours of sleep a night, hour and a half of sleep a night. Amen. Amen. So I hope you don't take this the wrong way, brother, but this is a little theory that I have. Um, you included, but myself, you know, I'm talking about myself, talking <laughs> about you. We were all looking young until we had kids. You know what I'm saying? And then once we had kids, <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Because I don't know about you. This is my experience. I was looking at, you know, in Facebook, you could see people you went to school with. And, you know, Kim and I, we had kids late. So so we were looking at people that we went to school with. And we're like, is that what kids do to you? And then uh around seven and a half eight years ago we had our kids and i think it's the sleep deprivation deprivation man because now uh now when i look on facebook i look like the same age as all the other people i went to to high school with so uh kids will definitely uh for sure man for sure and i think it's also just amount of like the uh, life and soul that you're willing to take out of yourself to give to them you know you're just like so willing to pour and pour and pour and pour into them you know to the point where case in point right like so usually I'd be shaped up tight. You can see my line right here. I do my own beard, cut my own son's hair, the line. Usually I'd be shaped up tight. Matter of fact, I was like, man, I ain't shaped up for this thing. My point is this, is that this morning, it, my son wasn't supposed to have a hockey game because it was raining. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, all right, they're going to they're gonna cancel the game. I'm outside in the garage working out. Oh, I gave myself some sleep, extra sleep this morning. I slept in until five. Ooh, right? That's, I mean, right? That's what I call sleeping in. And so I'm out in the garage working out until about 6.30. And I got crews running up north, so I'm doing some dis dispatching. All of a sudden, I get a, a text from the missus, hey, T's got his game. So I was planning on – If usually, I would have shaped myself up at around 4 o'clock in the morning, and I didn't. So the point there is that is – that's what I'm saying is like, you you know, why do I look rough right now? Not because I want to look rough, but because right. I got to go to my son's hockey game. Right. I ain't got no time to be like, oh, no, 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 we're, no, we're going to be running late. We're right, going to be right, running right. late. You know, so, so you know, it's it's the amount of just heart and soul that you put into these kids that it's like, you know, to your point, it's like, yeah, you look at, normally it'd be like, you're just constantly staying fresh. And now it's like, hey, bro, I'm just glad the day went smooth. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. Anytime that you make it through a day and they don't get injured or anything, you know, it's a good day. It's a good Amen. day. And, and I just want to piggyback on what you said as well. Even you can watch a movie before having kids and then you watch a movie after having kids and it's a totally different movie. You see what I'm saying? Like it is oh, a totally sure. different movie because, <laughs> you know, like when the hero's driving like 140 miles an hour before kids, you're like, oh, he's cool. You know, and then when he's driving 140 miles an hour after you have kids, you're like, somebody's kids are on the street. What is he doing driving 140 miles an hour? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. No, for sure. There, I mean, the, and I think that I think that uh, merges into every avenue of life. You know, the things that you would have called semi-appropriate prior to kids. You know, now all of a sudden it's like, nah, I ain't good with that, bro. I ain't, like, I ain't good with that. And so, so to, yeah. So that, I think that's a, a great analogy of the drive. Yeah, it's like, it's like, nah, man. You know, because now exactly right, I find myself somebody zoom. I live in a neighborhood where if somebody cuts through our street, you got four or five dads staring at you, like grilling at you. And I'm thinking to myself, like, man, it wasn't even 20 years ago before we were all driving around in little, you know, low rider Honda Civics with three star rims on them and stuff like that, you know. And so I agree, brother. I agree. Amen, good stuff. Amen. Now, what inspired you to start your own business? Um, Again, coming from uh, some some of my family members are just entrepreneurs and um, contractors. But, you know, I always say like an entrepreneur is just an entrepreneur. I don't care whether you spit sign shoes at the airport or whether you are, you know, this, that or the other large wig, what have you. But the entrepreneurial spirit is just it's just it's just a unique kind of spirit. Um, one could argue it's a little defiant. 
you know, it's um, it's definitely defiant. I mean, you, I mean, absolutely, it's not a little defiant. It is defiant. Um, and so for me, I, I you know, I just uh, I, I I I was great in school. My grades were great, phenomenal. Um, going back to that defiance, the, you know, the only thing that I ever had an issue with in school was I was just. I was a kid that never created the fight, but if you brought the fight to me, I was glad to help you get what you wanted. You know, in other words, just always a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, a little bit defined, a little bit like, you know, like I'll show you, I'll do this, I'll do that. Um, and so again, listening to like my, both of my grandfathers, both were contractors and were successful at it. Um, which is why I think also why my parents weren't entrepreneurs, because I think they both grew up seeing the grind of that. And how much the work of that is and was that they, you know, respectfully just, you know, went the, the normal route, if you would. Um, and uh, again, because now that I look back when my mom tells me stories, you know, of like, you know, her dad walking in at, on Christmas Eve at one o'clock in the morning covered in drywall dust. And it's because he had to get, you know, this house done because it was going to go on the market on, you know, on New Year's Eve. And um, and, he, you know, he, he always my mom's dad always had to, I think, the the most direct answer I ever heard in my life of why he works so hard and why he works so much. Uh, his literal answer was just simply this, I'm afraid of ever being poor again. And I remember just being like, man, he didn't give you no, like, it wasn't no, like, because I want to provide for my, you know, I want to buy, I want to do, I want to this. It was like, nah, dude, I'm just afraid of being poor. I'm afraid of being poor again. You know, I'm talking like backwoods, West Virginia poor, you know, like no running water, you know, a curtain is your front door in the middle of the winter poor. You know, not what we call in some parts of America, like, hey, um, you know, I've got the worst cell service poor. Like, nah, dude, I'm talking like I'm talking like don't pick the apples from the apple tree because we're going to turn those in the to, to and homemade applesauce. And that's going to be what we're going to give away for Christmas gifts poor. you know. Um, so, to, so to the question is, I saw that and I heard that and it kind of just I was uh, the kid in me, if you would. <laughs> is is you know growing up in the 80s and 90s like a lot of kids I, I grew up on comic books right and so i always saw these these attributes and and pr predominantly men is what i was looking at because i'm a man right so predominantly in men i was looking at these attributes as like almost like like superhero qualities like dang grandpa what do you mean you can go with only like three hours of sleep and just work and work and work and work and just grind and do and move and hustle and you know, Grandpa, man, did you just get off and you about to drive down to Florida? You know what I mean? Do a 13-hour drive and go look at a house you're trying to buy? And so I, I just, I, I became fascinated with almost like this, like, superhuman-like, you know, mentality of these men, some of these men that I was seeing where they were just willing to, I hate to say it, suffer to obtain. And going back when you look at, like, the superheroes, right? Like, let's just be real. Like, they all suffer a little bit to be. And so it was this like um, uh, fascination with that. And then the taste of it, the real taste of it came from, uh, you know, I mean, dude, I was the kid that would, I would literally go collect acorns, skin them, wash them, put salt on them and walk around people's houses and try to sell you salted acorns. I mean, I was a hustler from day one. I was like right. seven years old doing that stuff, man. But the real, real taste of it was I was, I was working for a gentleman where we were, I was, I was 18 years old. Just got out of high school and I called up this ad in the paper, right? This was back in the day when you would call it an ad in the paper, a little teeny ad in the paper. And he picked up the phone and I still remember like it was yesterday. And he was like, it, we, they repair chimneys and sweep chimneys. And it's, and uh, it said something like five to seven hundred dollars a week. Now, you know, and what would that be? Put it back in like 1999, 2000. You know, for an 18 year old, that was like, what? You know, I was like, 700 bucks, like, okay. I'm up and um, hired me around the spot with the phone because he obviously needed somebody. Now, I didn't know that then. You know, now that, that, at that time, I was like, I must have really handled that conversation well. Lo and behold, he just needed somebody to work. So right. um, it, it, uh, uh, it was unorthodox. He ran it out of his, his house which whatever, a lot of contractors do it. That, that's not most of the most unorthodox part about it. He in general was just very unorthodox. Um, but he was very good at taking a shoestring budget and making it look big 
So to put that in perspective, we had contracts with the White. Yeah, he, he had contracts with the White House, the Capitol building, uh, the, all the Ritz Carl, the Ritz Carlton up in the city, all the uh, historical properties through like uh, Old Town Alexandria and certain other ones in D.C. So here I am, 18, 19 years old, and I'm going into, I've been in rooms that, you know, Michael Jackson and Michael Jordan couldn't have paid to walk in. And here I am, like, I'm talking like walking into a room, you know, where they tell you, like, you see these glasses right here? The last person that touched those was Jackie Onassis. So my young man, if you bump that table, you were literally going to shift history. And so here I am doing all these things. And what at the time I felt was amazing. Here I am standing on top of the Capitol building. You know what I mean? Like working. You know, I'm in the Ritz Carlton. I'm in the white, you know, I'm doing these amazing things. And and on top of that, I was being paid bank. It was way more than 700. I was getting like 12 to 1400 a week. And looking back on it, the reason was is because I finally one day stopped and sat down and we worked. I believe my math serves me correct. It was 132, 136 days straight before I had a day off. Like this dude was like, this dude was a grinder as well. Like we just grinded. I mean, we'd be we'd be on houses, my friend. That uh, if we were working out in like Ashburn and Leesburg and Aldi at the time, way before it was built up, now we would be out there on a higher end home where the the customer was building it or the customer was out of town for renovations, and we would rebuild these chimneys, which, mind you, is some of the most back breaking labor ever. H scaffolding, brick tongs. I could get into that, but that joint. I mean, it was it, it hardened me quick. Uh, um, it'd be nine at night out there literally nine ten o'clock at night laying bricks and, and would need to be back sometimes sometimes would go home and sleep for two hours and go to the ritz carlton and work from 11 to 4 because the ritz their agreement with us was that we couldn't come midday because their clientele was so high end they couldn't see a chimney maintenance company walking around midday so we had to execute in the middle of the night so I did, I did this for, you know, a couple of years and um, he really showed me some cool, unique little kind of ambiances of how, like I said, how to take a shoestring budget and make it feel big. Um, and the, the, the thing that I remember just really was the day where I went, hmm, we had a customer of ours say, hey, Justin, um, can you can you get up there and take a look at my gutters and see if they're dirty or need to be maintained or anything? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I looked at my boss and I was like, and he's like, yeah, go ahead. I hopped up there, um, yelled down to her. I said, yeah, these need to be cleaned out. And I need to probably refasten some of these screws. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm rather at this point in my life, I'm like a cat on these roofs. I'm running around. I mean, I'm in a, the gutters on a 4,000 square foot. You know, I'm literally ding, 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 running around like a cat. And, you know, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the clock. So far I'm concerned, it's just my job. My boss told me to do something. Do it. Yeah, I, I'll charge you for that. It'd be 150. She came out with 150 cash. She proceeded to give it to my boss. And he looked at her and said, no, no, I'll give it to Justin. She gave me $150 cash. And I knocked that out in like 15 minutes. So instead of $10 an hour, it was $10 a minute. You know what I mean? I was like, I was like, huh. So it, 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 it proceeded, you know, we started getting some of those small little requests here and there. And he would always bless me and just let me have the cash. Um, and, uh, again, not to make this too long winded, but I, I came across a guy at a guy, you know, again, life is interesting, right? The, the moments that just pivot you in your life. I was at a gas station and the guy was like, saw me with my truck and my ladders and my setup. And, um, he was like, Hey man, you know, I'm thinking about starting a style of business to that and the other, you want to kind of come in half with me. I don't know this man from Adam. And, and we, I was like, well, let's get together. Let's talk about it. And we did exactly that. And um, I think within the first month, I was, again, making some pretty good money. And it, it just compounded. It was just one of those things where it, it just kind of snowballed. Uh, and then before you know it, me and him parted ways uh, for no other reason than just, you know, he was moving. Nothing bad, nothing negative. Um, but I had this clientele base that we were maintaining gutters for and like replacing patients off it. And before I know it, I turned around, I had like two or 300 customers and, you know, and I'm like, man, I'm, I'm like, this is just simple math. If, if I can get X amount of clients that pay me X amount of dollars, 
and we can execute X amount of in a day, X amount in a week, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I was like, this is just basic math. Right. It's just a matter of creating the math of it. Right. And um, it, it, it was that. It was exactly that. It was just uh, it, it was just being observant. And going back to what you were saying about, you know, telling your kids this, that, and the other, it's a matter. I think one of the biggest flaws I see in just humans in general is they they see things, case in point, like my grandfather talking to my future grandfather. They see things as coincidences or, you know, quinkadink. Oh, look at that. Isn't that just, you know, unique? But if you're really, if your senses, you know, the Bible says those who have eyes, you know, see, you know is if you're really looking and you're paying attention, these are moments where, as far as I'm concerned, God himself is like reaching down out of the heavens and trying to grab you by like your head like a Lego person, go go that way. And, you know, looking back on it, it's like, man, if I'd have looked at that guy in the gas station and been like, man, you're crazy. I got a good job working for this guy. I'm in the Capitol. I'm running around here, there guaranteed to work all day every day and you want me to come work for you stranger you know we're driving a ford lightning f-150 with gold chains looking like a, a you know a mr t a knockoff a cheap knockoff of mr t and, and that's what he did look like and uh you know just uh just a caucasian version and um and i just remember and, and again you know no judgment there because he was a nice guy great guy but that's just the way he carried himself his swagger he was from out he was from Miami, and. Um, I mean, gosh, looking back on that, I could have easily just been like, nope. And who knows where I'd be. And because of that, because I was aware and I prayed on it and I thought about it, it took me in this direction. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Now, Justin, you weren't always the organized family and businessman that you are today. Um, when I first met you, uh, if someone had told me 10 years from now that you would have been a movie star, I could have believed it. Uh, if someone had told me that you would have been a millionaire doing sales, uh, working for some company doing sales, I could have believed that as well. Uh, and if someone told me that you were going to be a successful business person, I could have believed it. If someone had told me you were going to be a preacher, I could have believed it. Um, but you had the gift of gab when I first met you and you had the connections, you know, of knowing family who had been contractors and everything else. But around 10 or 11 years ago, something flipped in you. And like there, like there was something that changed in you where you developed this hyper focus. You stopped hanging out with, um, mm. with uh, mm. people who weren't headed in the right direction. Uh, mm. You got this laser focus. So I've always assumed that it was Kindle. So I don't know. I mean, can you just clarify for us? Was it? Was it Kindle? Was it your first kid? Or was was it some other divine experience that caused you to flip a switch around 10 or 11 years ago to put you in this hyper focus where it's made you the successful businessman that you are today? Well, first and foremost, thank you for all the kind observations. You've always uplifted me and said those amazing things. And I appreciate you, brother. I really do, man. And uh, I, I appreciate your candor you've always had with me. I, I trust me. I still remember a lot of the things you you said to me. I remember still sitting in that Borders and Woodbridge and you hit me with, with like, hey, man, you could be this, 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 and this just by me li listening to you run your mouth right now. <laughs> you, know I mean? like, like, you know, and... and and I and I appreciate it, man, because I took those to heart, and I and I appreciate the positive, you know, statements there. Um, um, you know, if if I were really to dive in deep, and I feel like this is a narrative right now that's not popular in the world. So everything you listen to is true. Yes, it's Kendall. Yes, it is my first kid. Absolutely, first and foremost, it, it's always God. It's always God. But He gave me this too. Um, and I, I and again, I could go so many directions with this one as well. But if I, there's just, I've, I've always had a level of intensity about me, like always. Um, and this, this is the part that I mean that it's not correct right now, politically correct. You know, there's a lot of talk of, you know, toxic masculinity, this, that, whatever the case may be. But I am, I should have been a Viking, bro. You know what I mean? Like, like that old, like I'm, I'm very, um, there's parts of me that are very archaic. Um, I, I just, 
from losing my grandmother early, who was like a mother, by the way, I was raised with her in my house. I mean, I was born, there she was. It wasn't like, oh, this is the grandmother that comes around every once in a while. Um, it, it, it was just seeing some things in my life and, and, and knowing people who passed away, as you know, and, and this and that and other and just other things. Um, there was just a level of just ferocity in me that I really believe with all my heart that was God sent and put in me. Um, I think sometimes, you know, I think a lot of the times and quite often because it's more easier to absorb, it's better for the palate, it's, it's, it's friendlier, everything about it. God, Christ is talked about in a way that is just so loving. And I get that. And I am aware of that. And I agree with that. And I feel that. And I know that. I mean, anybody who's ever had a child and has stood in the delivery room, and if you're a believer, you have felt a level of of vulnerability as a man that is like, oh my gosh, like I cannot do anything for this child right now. God is all you. So that's that love moment. But for me, you know, I've also had a relationship always with God that there was a level of of like almost coach, like almost like slapping me on the back, like, come on, man. Like I did not make you for this. I did not make you for this junk, this garbage. Come on, get after it. Go like, like, like literally intensity. Um, and on a level that, you know, some of the viewers, anybody who may see this, you know, or anybody who may would even be listening to this would be like, dude, pipe down. So in other words, meaning I can't, I can't show you right now because it would probably come off quirky and weird. The level of like the intensity God has driven in me of like, this is it, bro. Like, what do you think this is? Dress rehearsal? Like, you know what I mean? Like you think like you, like you, and, and it came about getting to your question. It came about you know, praise be to God again, great people like you in my life and others. Um, it came about right in that time frame when me and you, when me and you were starting to meet and hang out and kick it and, uh, you know, and, and things is, um, it just, to be honest with you, it felt like a second chance, man. It felt like that's the best, that's the best way that I can say it. It just felt like a second chance. I feel like, God, and, I, and I just felt like God would not, man, I remember, I remember walking into the Jesus bookstore over there in Woodbridge. I remember one time, I mean, I mean, I'm six foot one, 230 pounds. And I have not shrunk that much or gotten bigger. That, in other words, I'm not a small guy. I'm not a wimpy looking guy. I'm not the cliche like, oh, look at this soft man. Look. But I remember walking into this bookstore. And I remember being so overwhelmed with love and joy. So getting back to the fact that I understand God is exactly that as well, too. Love and joy. But I remember I had to go to the back of it because I just was crying, mm. like welling up. Like, I, I just was like, so I, di- I didn't know all this existed in this world. I didn't know there was people like that behind the counter who would just stop and pray with me and talk to me mm-hmm. and show me scripture. I didn't know about this. I didn't, it's not, when I say I didn't know, I knew they were there, but I never experienced it. And when I started to experience it, it's like the, the love aspect of it is what shifted me. And when it shifted, it, it became a veracity and a fire because it was like God's way of saying, like, okay, cool. We've got the love thing figured out. You know I'm for you. You know I'm with you. Now I need you to understand it's go time, bro. It's go time. You know, you have squandered the last amount of years, X amount of years. We can't get them back. You know, they're gone. I need you to, to make up time. And I, and so if that's what you're going to do, I'm going to think about it right again. You heard me say right off the bat, I'm a mad. So to make up time, you know, for me, it was like, all right, well, if you squandered 50 hours a week for those six years, well, then you need to put in a hundred hours a week now because mm. you got to double up, right. you got to double up that time. And that's where that veracity came from that veracity of like, all right, well, if, if, um, if if a good man does this, then I'm going to double that. If a good man works a 40-hour week, then I'm going to work an 80-hour week. If a good man, you know, um, massages his wife's feet twice a week, I'm going to massage him four times a week. 
right, right, right. Know, every everything just became this intensity of uh, just realizing it was. And again, getting not to go off too much, I'm gonna ramble, but it, it was a second chance. It was a second chance, and and that's what I was. I was very much made aware of that, and it, and it came from people meeting people such as yourself, realizing who now soon to be Pastor Roberts was gonna be in my life. Um, seeing other friends I know have transitions in their life, seeing friends who were falling off and falling out, which is fine. Um, it just, I was very aware of the second chance. And I just, I just, I just remember, and let me just say this. I got to say this. I remember a very specific prayer I had to God. I said to him, I said, God, I always knew I wanted to be a husband and a father. I, I had no questions asked. Like I just knew it. Like that, I, that was like, you know what I mean? Like I just knew that would be the the stuff that would just, you know, bring my glues together. And I, and I remember saying to him in a prayer, God, if you can get an amazing wife, beautiful, healthy, amazing wife. Hey, look, man, I'm just being real. Like I like, oh man, look at him. He's praying to God. Like it's a wish list. Hey man, it says, come to, come to me with everything and anything. Knocking out, you shall receive. You know what I'm saying? Like, bro, well, hey, here I come and I'm knocking. Amen. And so, so give me a beautiful, amazing wife. Give me healthy children. And I swear to you, everything else, God, I will not bother you with. Amen. Now, now, some hearing that would say, but hold on. You just say, come to him with everything, which I do. Let me be very clear. I pray about pretty much anything and everything. But at the time, I felt like I gave him so many, you know, hey, God, can you help me out with? And then I renege. Hey, God, can you help me out with? And then I renege. That this was the one prayer where I was like, God, man, if you can just do this. All the other stuff in life become financially smart. I won't bother you with that. Um, take care of my body. Oh, I won't bother you with that. Um, go to bed in a timely manner so I can get up, you know, in a timely manner. Oh, I won't bother you with that. I won't bother you with the trivial disciplines of life because I know those are naturally good. It's mm. it's good for me to eat healthy food, God. So I won't bother you with that. I just the things I know I can't control whatsoever. Please help that. And that that prayer, those moments, those those years, those months, those weeks, those minutes, it was just this awakening of a second chance, brother. And I was like, man, I am not going to squander this. And so it fired up as an intensity, man. And it just and it just kept rolling. It kept compounding. It just I just kept getting blessed, man. I mean, like every time there, there was there was a year or two, as you know, a lot of times when people first come to God, there's you know, sometimes there can be a, the first couple of years where it is like. It, it can it can feel and seem so good because it wasn't is where it was like man whoa 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 the transition was just insane you know like I'm meeting my wife I'm starting a business I'm having children you know all this stuff was coming at me so fast it was you know for me I couldn't help but run my mouth about God to anybody and everybody I met because it was like dude you know oh okay you don't want to believe in the book that I believe in okay well can you touch my hands oh yeah I can touch your hands you can touch my arms. All right, well, I'm tangible, brother. Like you're telling me you don't believe in this because you feel it's not tangible. Well, I'm tangible. And I'm looking you here in your eye right now that the moment I the moment I submitted to him, it just started to come. Amen. It just started to come. This is only part one of our interview with Justin Stanley. Part two will be released in two weeks. In the meantime, if you have any roofing issues, please contact Justin at Gutter Ethics. Gutter Ethics can be found on Facebook.